Hi guys, and welcome to a Hector Lecture Guide to the Fight Dragon Songs Reprise Ultimate. This video is going to cover the second phase of this fight, Thornton Phase. Before beginning this phase, you want to pre-agree on a couple of positions with your party. First, you need spread positions. These are going to be in light parties. They're going to be in sort of a triangular shape based around either a cardinal or intercardinal, and the two groups are always going to be directly opposite each other. Because which pair of cardinals or intercardinals you're spreading onto is random, you also want to have a set place where each group will go to. I recommend having your ones go to either the red or purple waymarks, and your twos going to either the yellow or blue waymarks. You also need to have partner spread positions. These are going to be where your tank or healer is going to stack with a DPS, and you're each going to be spread to a different cardinal. With that said, let's go through the basics of the fight. Be aware throughout this fight, Thornton's autos cleave in a small area in front of them, so make sure that your main tank is always away from the party whenever auto attacks are happening. The first mechanic you see is Ascalon's Mercy Concealed. This is a baited protein wave. Stack together for when the cast bar finishes, and as soon as the cast bar finishes, you want to move to the side. Thornton stabs the ground and then hits a protein where everybody just was. Getting hit by these is likely to kill you, so make sure that you dodge to the side. Immediately afterwards, the main tank is going to get targeted with three Conal Ascalon's Might mini tank busters. While each one individually doesn't hurt too bad, the three in a row hit quite hard, so you want to use some light mitigation and some support from your healers to help keep your tank alive. Afterwards, the boss is going to start summoning a bunch of knights to his side, ready to cast the first major trio mechanic, Strength of the Ward. As the knights jump away, you want to pre-position near to where you agreed to spread to earlier in the fight. So our ones are nearer to red-purple, and our twos are nearer to yellow-blue. Thornton's going to appear in the middle and immediately start to cast Lightning Storm, meaning that our players need to be spread. You also have another knight in the middle casting Heavy Impact, which will be an Earthen Wave AoE that will start from the middle and then go out in waves from there. The most important thing to look for, though, are the three knights on the outside of the arena. Each of these knights is going to be on a different cardinal or intercardinal, and they're about to do a spiral thrust dash through the middle. If we look at where these AoEs are about to hit, you'll see that there's always exactly two safe spots, and they'll be directly opposite each other. Your party needs to rotate to those safe spots and spread within them. To help to space this out correctly, you might notice that around the outside of the arena, there's little fidget spinner markers, you might call them, that are directly placed on each cardinal and intercardinal. Your melees and ranged want to be spread about four crystals to the left or to the right of those fidget spinners. Your healers can stack directly on them, and your tanks can use these way marks as guidance for where they can stand to not be too far into the middle. The dashes will go off at the same time that the spreads do. Be aware those spreads are quite large. The first earthen wave will go out, and you want to position ready to try to dodge it after either two or three waves. Be aware that at this time, Thornton's starting to cast another Ascalon's Mercy Concealed, so right about the time that you finish dodging the earthen wave, be looking at his cast bar to see when you need to move to the side. In this case, our party is going to dodge into the third wave and immediately move to the side. The fourth wave will go out at about the same time as the proteins. Now, before I go on to the next bit, I just want to show you another possible earthen wave pattern, as this tends to be one of the easier ways to die. If you notice that your knight that's doing the earthen wave happens to be quite close to one of the two sides, here's how I recommend dodging this. Your main tank, or whichever tank is on that side, wants to immediately just dodge into the first. Everybody else on that northern side is going to stack on their healer, waiting to dodge into the second. I recommend everybody in the south who sees the earthen wave starts quite far away instead tacks on the tank. In this way, the group in the north is going to be able to comfortably dodge after two, and the group in the south is going to be able to comfortably dodge after three. This mechanic gets much trickier if you wait to dodge into the fourth earthen wave, as you're going to have to do that simultaneously with the Ascalon's Mercy Concealed dodge. Either way that you dodge the earthen wave, you're now going to get four knights spawning. Immediately position near to the middle and prepare for the combination of mechanics. You're going to get these sort of doom void puddles appearing. And if you look, these are going to grow as they normally do. But when they grow, they're going to leave four safe spots that will either be on all cardinals or all intercardinals. 
Three players are also going to get targeted with blue markers. They're about to get hit with a massive AoE that causes a physical vuln, which means that if they clip anyone with it or they clip each other with it, any player hit by two will die to this. You want to use these three knights as your guide to where to go. Each of these knights is leading the way towards a safe spot for the one of the blue marker players. These players should spread to the edge of these spots as quickly as they possibly can. Everybody else will be using the last safe spot, the one down at three, as where they're going to hide for this mechanic. Be aware there are towers, but they don't matter yet, so we'll ignore them for this point. The tanks need to not immediately head to their safe spot. Instead, they each need to hug one of the knights in the middle, who are going to tether random players with the tank mother tethers that you've seen in the first phase. These need to be picked up each by a tank and dragged over towards the safe spot. At this time, Thornton's going to drop down and start to cast Dragon's Rage. This is essentially a stack. You need to have all five of those players that are in the final safe spot close enough together to share this. Be aware that this hits quite hard. It can be survived with less than five with very heavy mitigation, but it's much simpler to have both tanks and the three players who don't have blue markers to all share this together. As the markers start to grow, the tanks will pick up their tethers while everyone else goes to their safe spot. And at the last second, the tanks are going to run over and go to the sides of the safe spot to make sure they don't clip anybody as the uh, knights in the middle dash towards them. Everything's about to go off at once. The blue markers are going to get jumped on with massive AoEs. The stack's going to hit in the group near to Thordon, And the two tanks are going to get dashed at and stunned before their tank buster. Now... Be aware, with the positioning that I've just shown you, the only way for your tanks to survive consistently is to invuln. Not because the damage from the tank buster is too high to take with cooldowns, but because with where H1 and M2 are positioned, they're likely to clip the tanks with their blue circle. There is a way to adjust if you choose to not have both tanks use your invulns here. All you have to do is have those blue markers who are on the side. So they're not with Thordon, they're not opposite Thordon, they're on one of the side safe spots. They're just going to go about two crystals away from Thordon. This will make sure that they don't kill R1 with their jump, but they also don't clip either of the tanks, and therefore your tanks are free to take this with cooldowns if you choose. You might find it most comfortable to have one tank take it with an invuln and the other take it with heavy cooldowns. Be aware that there is a tank buster in the third phase close enough that if you invuln this, your invuln is unlikely to be up for that. However you manage to take this, your tanks are going to be stunned, so the other six players are responsible for taking the six towers. If you had a blue marker, it's real simple. There will always be a tower directly in front of you. You soak that tower as soon as you can. The other three players need to adjust into the three towers nearest to where Thordon was. Now, if you look closely at the three players, while they are stacked together, they have subtly hinted where they are going to be moving towards, with H2 moving towards the tower on the left, and the two DPS taking the two on the right. Adjust into your towers, and soak them while the tanks repeatedly get hit by their hard-hitting tank busters. If everything's gone correctly, Thornton's going to spawn in the middle, and immediately start casting Ancient Quagga. This is a hard-hitting raid-wide requiring mitigation. Have your group come together, Mitigate and heal through the cast. Make sure nobody is stood near to your main tank at this point in time, as immediately after this cast finishes, that main tank is going to start taking autos. Thordon will now cast Heavenly Heal. This is a very hard-hitting tank buster that also forces a tank swap. Have your main tank take it with significant cooldowns, or potentially even an invuln, and have your off-tank provoke during the cast to swap. Be aware that your off tank needs to be away from both the main tank and the party, as they are going to immediately be targeted with three Asalon's Might Cleaving Conal Tank Busters. Again, this only needs light mitigation, but some support from your healers. We now get the second major trio mechanic of this phase, Sanctity of the Ward. More knights are called in, and when the cast bar finishes, you want to again pre-position in the middle. I recommend standing near to whichever player has the same role as you. The reason is that you're about to get three knights spawning in the middle, as well as a dragon's eye around the outside. First, focus on the two paladins in the middle. They are always going to be opposite each other and facing either clockwise or counterclockwise. In this case, both of them are facing clockwise. We want to take note of this, as this is going to inform which way we're going to dodge shortly. Secondly, two players are going to get sword markers above their head, one with a one sword and one with a two sword. These are showing what the Dark Knight is about to do. 
You may know this mechanic better as limit cuts, but it's essentially the same as what you saw in P2S with Campios Harma. The Dark Knight is going to jump onto the one sword player, and then onto the two sword player, and then back on the one, and then back on the two. Every time that that jump happens, the Dark Knight needs to have gone almost the entire length of the arena, and the damage needs to be soaked as a light party. So, to solve this, we're going to have the player with the one sword and three other players go directly opposite the Dark Knight, and the player with the two swords and three players with them are going to go directly behind this. For the most part, you can default to your light parties of ones go opposites and twos go towards, but as you can see here, because the swords go on random players, this can goof things up. These stacks can be survived with a 5-3 split, but it's not ideal. So I strongly recommend that you look at which players have this and adjust. In this case, since H2 has to go opposite Dark Knight, H1 is going to see their partner going opposite and is going to go with the Dark Knight. As long as you always do the opposite of what your role partner does, you're always going to have a 4-4 split. Be aware that during this mechanic as well, to add in another layer of difficulty, Thornton will be casting a gaze attack, and that gaze attack will be mirrored by the dragon's eye at the same time. Before the mechanic begins, you want to be in your light parties, all four of you at the edge of the arena. You want to be not directly behind the dark, but instead we've cheated three crystals in the direction that the paladins were facing. Because they were facing clockwise, our whole group has gone about three crystals clockwise and is going to wait there. As you wait for the Paladin dashes to start, make sure your whole group is looking away both from Thornton and the Dragon's Eye to not get hit by the gaze. I'm now going to show you a massively slowed down version of what these dashes look like. What we're looking for is as soon as we see an explosion in front of our group in the clockwise direction, our whole group is going to move that way. You start three crystals after the first fidget spinner, and you end three crystals before the next fidget spinner. That will work perfectly for safe spots every time. Just to rewind to show that again. You can see the Dark Knight is jumping between group one and group two, and our groups are going to move as soon as they see the first explosion go off. Healers need to be healing here as these stacks hit very heavily, and you might want to use at least one or two mitigations as well as shields to help to support your group throughout this. When the whole thing finishes, you can immediately go towards your partner stack groups. Thornton and four knights spawn around the arena. Thornton's going to stab the ground and make the whole outside of the arena unsafe. We're not going to need that, so it doesn't really matter. One of the knights is going to cast these four fiery circles at the, each of the intercardinals, and another knight is going to start casting Hyernal Storm. This is why we're in partner stack groups. This needs to be soaked by a group of two, and you need to make sure that you've always got your partners as one support with one DPS so that they don't have one group get hit by two of the icy stacks. These icy stacks are about this large, which is why we're spread to each of the cardinal waymarks. Now, to make things difficult, two players either two supports or two DPS, will be targeted with these markers here. If you get targeted with these markers, as we finish this first set of mechanics, you're going to start dropping comets. If two comets are dropped too near to each other, they explode, wiping the group. Thus, players with comets need to constantly be moving, and they need to make sure they never run into each other. Since we have very limited space to work with, the only way to make this work is to try to make sure these comet players are directly opposite as we start. Thus, Given the way the comets appeared this time, we need to do a swap. H2 is going to swap with the tank in the south to make sure that we have the two comet players directly opposite. They can be either north-south or east-west, though there is a limit to that as I'll show you later in the video. You're now going to get a set of towers, and this is the main difficulty of this mechanic. There will always be eight towers, and their pattern can seem almost random, but there's a logic to it. If we split the arena into quadrants, you'll see that each quadrant will always have only one or two towers on the outside. If you have two towers on the outside, like the south or the east, when the partner stack goes off, both players are going to dodge to the outside of the arena and each one will soak one of the towers. If you have only one tower on the outside, when the partner stacks go off, you're going to have one player dodge to the outside and one player dodge to the inside. Be aware that while the outside towers work well with the quadrants, the inside ones don't always follow that rule. So for the inside, you may need to adjust to the other players to make sure there's one player in each of the inner towers. Now, how do we know who goes where for the towers? Well, whichever players had meteors have to dodge to the outside, so you might as well have their entire role, in this case the supports, dodge and take the outside towers. 
If there's one at tower out and one tower in, it's the tank healer that would go out and the DPS that would go in, in this case. Now, we also want to make sure that our meteors are as far opposite each other as possible. If you look at the north, there's only one place our meteor player can go. It's the middle tower. In the south, though, there are two possible towers. The better choice would be to have our meteor player go into the middle tower so our meteors can be more opposite. Since this tower is the more counterclockwise one, you can call this out and say meteors are going, support rolls are going to go counterclockwise this time. You can set this in place, so tanks and healers always go one direction, DPS always go the other direction, but you increase the risk that your Comet players are not going to be opposite each other enough to avoid running into one another. The ice stacks are now going to go off, and as they do, everything else explodes. Immediately afterwards, adjust into where you need to go for your tower. As soon as those towers go off, your meteor players need to start running. They're going to run in a semicircle clockwise, and they're going to end up directly opposite where they started. As they start to run, and the meteors start to drop, we're going to get eight towers starting to spawn. These will always be on every cardinal and every intercardinal on the outside. Whichever role had meteors, in this case tanks and healers, they take the cardinal towers. So meteor players will be north and south, but the opposite of where they started. The other supports are going to be whichever cardinal tower is next to them, and DPS are each going to take an intercardinal tower. If you are on the outside, you go to the tower near to you. If you're on the inside, you may need to adjust. So M1 and R1 would be using this time right now, and there's quite a lot of time to look which intercardinals are not being soaked. They're going to position themselves to be able to go towards those towers. While we're at it, look at how our meteor players are running. The plan is to try to do sort of a zigzag motion. So you're using as much of the space as you possibly can. This will increase the chance that your meteors are fully spread out and that they don't accidentally get too close and cause a wipe. About the time that the fourth meteor drops, the Knight in the Middle starts to cast Faith Unmoving. Anytime when this is up, you can cast Knockback Immunity and prevent yourself from getting knocked back to death if you're on the outside. Only do this if you're on the outside. M1 and R1 instead are not going to cast Knockback Immunity and will instead ride the Knockback to be able to make it easier to get to their tower. You don't have to ride the Knockback, but it makes it very difficult and you'll likely need to use a movement skill to get into your tower otherwise. After seven towers, uh, comets have been baited, your comet players can immediately move into their towers, the puddles will disappear, the knockback will go off, and all eight towers can get soaked. I'm going to rewind just to show one unfortunate possibility that can happen with comets. Suppose you get this tower set. This is one of what we think are 18 different sets of towers that can appear. There's a problem with this set. If you adjust without thinking to have your comets north-south, you run into an issue. There are only two towers on the outside, one on each side, and they're too near to each other. If this is the setup you get and you try to move your comments around, your comments will get too close together, your uh, healer in the south is going to run into a tank comet, and the comets will explode, wiping the party. Instead, with this particular pattern, the way to correctly solve it was to instead have the tank in the north adjust so that the comets are east-west. This has a set of towers that will work. There's always a possible set either north, south, or east, west, but not always both. In fact, there is exactly one out of 18 patterns where north, south will kill the group, and two out of 18 patterns will east, west will kill the group. If you don't mind that one in 18 chance of things being just out of your hands, you can have your group always adjust to north, south, and 17 out of 18 times everything will work out just fine. Now, ignoring all that, skipping forward again to when we finish off the end of Sanctity of the Ward, after the towers finish, you want to have your entire group stack at A. Thornton will reappear and start to transition the arena and cast his ultimate attack, ultimate end. This needs heavy mitigation and shielding as it hits for very high raid-wide damage. If your group survives ultimate end, there's not much left. Thornton will flail around aimlessly as he's in a much more weakened state right now. And the only mechanic he's got left is to turn in a direction and cast broad swing. When you see the start... Dodge behind Thornton. He'll now cleave either the left or the right side in a wide arc. Dodge into the first cleave as he cleaves the other side and then behind him. He'll cast this one more time and dodge it exactly the same way with you moving into the first cleave and then dodging and waiting for the second two. And then he'll immediately start to cast Etheric Burst. This is his Enrage. 
you need to get him down to 0% before the cast goes off to be able to kill him and prevent your party wipe. If you do, the stage will transition and your group could stack middle and shield and mitigate heavily, ready for the transition into phase three. Thank you so much for watching my guide. I hope you found this useful. Please, with this guide more than any, please can you let me know in the comment section if there are any mistakes or if there are any uh, strategies that you found that are improved over what you've seen in the guide. I'd really appreciate to know it and I can put some updates on in future videos or as a comment on this video here. As always, thank you for watching. Take care.